how great this love oh it's moving all my mountains it's perfect love it's casting out my fear how great this love oh it welcomes me like family and anywhere I go, it meets me there. Cause he is good, and he is God. What I earn is not what I got. And he is just, yet also what I deserve is not what I find. What more could I say about him? My God is love. How great this love. Oh, it's faithful through my failures. It's trusting love, it's with me till the end. How great this love, oh, it's closer than a brother. And this is love, he died so I could live. And he is good, and he It's not what I got, and he is just, yet also kind. What I deserve, it's not what I find. What more could I say about him? My God is love. Thank you for that beautiful message that God is love. 
and with, we dwell with him and we dwell in love. We're glad you've joined us for worship today. Thank you for being here in the sanctuary and all of you are joining by Facebook Live and by live stream. We welcome you and we pray like we do every week that you feel God's presence as we worship him, as we hear the spoken word and as we share in lifting our voices in praise together. I'm gonna to ask those of you who are here, if you just take a moment and stand and greet those around you with a, uh, with a wave, I started to say a handshake, we probably better not do that, but just with a wave and let them know that you're glad they're worshiping with you today. <coughs> as we sing together love divine all loves excelling love be his wonder and his love and his praise as we continue in worship this morning. Oh, it chases me down, fights to 
still I found gleams of ninety-nine And I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away
a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. When she no longer has a place to hide, and I am not. What a powerful song that our fear doesn't stand a chance when we're standing in the power of God's love. And so grateful that you're here today. I'd like to welcome those of you worshiping with us virtually and all of you who are here in the sanctuary. It's great that we can worship together however and wherever we might be. But thank you so much for being a part of this worship service. And every week, there's an opportunity for us to pray together. And I hope that you've been praying. I know many of you committed to fast and pray for 21 days. And I believe that will end this week on Friday. But we continue to pray and to fast for a great move of God, a great move in our country, a great move in our families, in our churches that God's going to bring healing and God's going to bring unity and God's going to bring salvation. But however the Holy Spirit leads right now, you can stand or you can kneel or wherever you are worshiping at home, you can make that your altar. But I'm going to invite you to join me as we pray together. May we pray. God, thank you that our fear doesn't stand a chance when we stand in your love and God, as we just shared on Wednesday night, for God did not give a spirit of fear or timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of sound mind or self-discipline. Father, we thank you for your promise to be with us. And God, we are grateful to be able to worship you today. And Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would bring warmth on this cold day that, Father, maybe our spiritual lives have grown, grown cold and you're going to spark, God, a flame of renewal 
And God, you're going to bring about revival and spiritual awakening. Father, we pray for all the people that are worshiping today, whether here or at their home. God, touch them and bless them in a special way. Bless their family. Pray, God, where there are those who are sick, that you would bring healing. Father, just finding out this morning you would be with the Shoemaker family as Rachel is in the hospital. Bring healing to her and comfort to the, their family. Father, we pray for so many in our church family and extended family of faith that are grieving today. Father, we lift up Marty McLean and the loss of her mother. Father, we lift up Bobby Scruggs and the loss of his mother, that you would comfort them. And Father, that you would be with the Roberts family and the loss of Marlene. And Lord, that you would be with the Perry family and the loss of Jeff. And Lord, there are so many that are grieving. We pray continued prayers for the Hibbert family and Betty Herod and her family. Lord, the list is long of people that are hurting and grieving. Would you comfort them, God, we pray. Lord, I just pray for our nation. Father, we're so divided. We pray for healing. Father, we pray for protection. Father, as one administration leaves office and another comes in, Lord, I pray that it would be a peaceful transition. And Lord, that people would come together and be united. And Father, we're to pray for our leaders, whoever they may be. And Lord, we pray for great revival and spiritual awakening in our country. Father, we also know that tomorrow we celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And we pray, God, that there would be unity among our races. And Father, all the efforts that he made, Lord, to bring people together. And we pray, Lord, that we would be united. Lord, we pray on this Sanctity of Life Sunday that, Father, we would pray for those pregnancy centers to try to let young women know that there's another way than abortion that we need to be for life and for these children, these babies, to be advocates for them. And Father, we pray that you would bring healing to families again that are divided and hurting. And Father, we need this virus to leave and bring healing to all those that are still suffering from it and battling from it and those who have lost lives as a result of it. Help them, oh God bless their families. Father, I just pray for this church and all the churches that are trying to minister during these difficult days. Give us your wisdom, God, as we continue to seek your face and to follow your lead and to keep in step with your spirit. May Satan have no glory or victory, but only you would reign supreme. So, Father, we just pray that your Holy Spirit would move and Lord touch lives today and Lord if there's anyone watching or in this place that's never fully surrendered their life to Christ may this be the day of salvation for many and Father we just pray that Christians might be renewed in their faith and Lord that people might seek first your kingdom and your righteousness and know that you'll add all these other things unto us. So, Father, we come seeking you. Forgive us of our sin. We repent, Father, from the ways that we have tried to lead our families and our nation that have not always been in the way you would have us to go. We repent from that, and we want to follow your ways. So, Father, bless now the remainder of this service. Continue to sing and play through our musicians and speak through your word and give your servant strength, God, and speak through me. We'll give you all the praise and the glory and the honor for the victories we trust you to bring. In the strong name of Jesus, we ask, amen. 
This morning, if you have your Bible, would you turn with me to Psalm chapter 51, and I'm grateful for all of our beautiful music today, the instrumentalists, our worship team, and an ensemble. Thank you all for being here today, and for all of our ushers and greeters and people in the sound booth running cameras and screens. Again, it's a team effort. I'm grateful for everyone who gives of their time and talents to serve the Lord. But if you have your Bible, would you join me as we read Psalm 51? Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. This is the word of the Lord, and blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you all so much. What a great message and song. And praise God, we are newborn again when we know Christ as our Lord and Savior. I always like to share a little humor, and I've maybe shared this with you before, but pastor was out in the foyer greeting people after the service one day when one of their prim and proper ladies from the church came walking out, and 
she came up to the pastor and she said, Pastor, please don't take this personal. I'm so embarrassed that my husband got up and walked out during the, the middle of your sermon. And, and the pastor said, well, it's okay. I was a little disconcerted about it, but it, it's all right. She said, well, please don't worry about it. He's been walking in his sleep since he was a child. So, so if any of you get up during the service, I know what's going on. You know, uh, research showed in a Harvard uh, business review that the typical person makes about 2,000 decisions every waking hour. About 2,000 decisions every waking hour. Now, a lot of these decisions are minor, and uh, they come uh, automatically like, what am I going to wear in the morning, or what am I going to eat for lunch, or am I going to eat lunch now, or in about 10 minutes, those type decisions. And then there are some decisions that are very thought-provoking throughout the day and that have serious consequences. We know that making the right decisions arguably can be one of the greatest habits that we can develop. Did you hear that? Making right decisions arguably can be one of the greatest habits that we can develop in our lives. Our choices affect a lot, don't they? Our choices uh, affect our health. Our choices affect our safety. Our choices affect our relationships. Our choices affect our well-being. Our choices uh, affect our use of time. It affects our future. Choices affect so many areas of our lives, decisions that we make. In our psalm today, we see David, that man after God's own heart, who made some bad decisions in his life. In this passage, we see him asking for forgiveness and cleansing from his sin. But if you were to read over in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12, you would see a list of bad decisions that David made. Let me share a few of those. Well, you remember when he was king that David was out on his roof, on his palace, and he looked over and he saw Bathsheba, a beautiful woman who was taking a bath. Well, you know the story. David sent for her, and David committed adultery. And not only did he commit adultery, but then she became pregnant, and he tried to hide this sin. And so he sent her husband, Uriah, out to the front lines of battle. And if you were to read at the beginning of 2 Samuel chapter 11 that David should have been out fighting with his men. When kings were at war, David was staying at home. And as a result, he sent Uriah the Hittite out, and he was killed on the front lines of battle. And so David made once again another bad decision. And all through this story, we see David breaking many of the commandments the sixth commandment, the seventh commandment, the ninth commandment, the tenth commandment. He broke the commandment, you shall not kill. He broke the commandment, you shall not commit adultery. He, he broke the commandment, you shall not bear false witness. He broke the commandment, you shall not covet. He broke all these commandments because of his bad decision making. I don't know where you are today. But I'd be willing to say those of you who are here and those of you who are watching could maybe relate and say, I'm among one of those who have made some bad decisions, some bad choices in my life. And the fact is, David was a man after God's own heart, is why God called him. But yet he still made some bad decisions, some bad choices in his life. A couple of weeks ago, we began a series of sermons called Rebound. And through this series, we're looking at people in Scripture who found themselves in a 
hopeless or helpless situation, but then how through God's divine power, they were able to bounce back or to rebound from their circumstance, from their situation. And it's my prayer today that maybe some of the bad decisions that we've made, some of the bad choices that we've made, that we would learn to bounce back, to rebound with God's divine power. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about a young boy who was able to rebound from a serious health issue. Last week, we talked about Job, a man who was upright and blameless, who feared God and shunned evil, how he was able to bounce back or rebound from great loss in his life, losing his children, losing his finances, losing his own health. But through God's divine power, he was doubly blessed because he remained faithful. And once again today, we see David who has made a series of bad decisions, yet through God's divine power, he was able to rebound and to bounce back. So if that's you today, maybe you've made a bad decision morally. Maybe you have said and done some things that you regret maybe recently or from a long time ago, but you've been carrying the guilt for years and years, and it's time to give it all over to God. So how can we rebound from moral failure or even from murder in David's case? How can we rebound? Well, the first thing we need to acknowledge our mistake. Acknowledge our mistake. If you look in verse 3 of, of Psalm chapter 51, he said, For I know my transgression and my sin is always before me. For against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And if you look at the very first verse in chapter 51, it said, Have mercy on me as a result of your unfailing love. Have mercy on me. We know that David was acknowledging his mistake. What keeps us from acknowledging our mistakes and our bad decisions? Well, I think there are several things. One of the things that keeps us from acknowledging our mistake is pride, is pride. And you remember what Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Is it pride that's keeping you from acknowledging your mistake or your bad decision? You know what else keeps us from acknowledging our mistakes? People. And I think this is in a couple of ways. Number one, we like to blame other people for our mistakes. Isn't that what happened in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve disobeyed God? When they ate that forbidden fruit and they found themselves naked and they had to hide behind a bush and God came walking into the garden saying, where are you? And do you remember when he asked Eve what she had done? It's the serpent's fault. Or he asked first Adam. And Adam said, well, the woman gave me the fruit. And then he asked Eve, well, the devil gave me the fruit, Satan. And we've been playing the blame game ever since. Some of you are here, and you're blaming your wife. You're blaming your husband. You're blaming your son. You're blaming your daughter. You're blaming your coworker. You're blaming your boss. You're blaming the teacher. You're, you're blaming uh, the coach. You're, you're blaming the preacher. <laughs> you're blaming the doctor. It's so easy for us to place blame on someone else. But then not only do people keep us from acknowledging our mistake, but I think when we look at people, many times we like to compare ourselves and say, well, at least I'm not as bad as they are. When I've told all of you before, our standard is Jesus Christ. And we all fall short when we compare ourselves to Christ. But we can't look at somebody else and say, well, my sin's not as bad as their sin, or at least I'm not as bad as them. We can't get into that. We need to own and take responsibility for our sin. But you know why else I think people fail to acknowledge their mistakes or afraid of punishment? I've often wondered in this story, which David, again, a man after God's own heart, 
But Nathan, if you would read in 2 Samuel 11 and 12, Nathan the prophet had to confront him. I just wonder sometimes if people will keep sinning if they are not found out or if they're confronted. I wonder if people will keep that lifestyle until they're caught. But yet he was confronted and, and he had to acknowledge his sin. And I pray today that we would acknowledge our mistake. We would acknowledge our bad decision. We would acknowledge our sin and, and not compare ourselves to other people. There's a beautiful parable in Luke chapter 18, and it's verses 9 through 14, and you might remember it or you may not know this story, but Jesus is talking to some people who were feeling pretty righteous about themselves. They thought they were better than other people. And Jesus, so here's a parable. Here's a parable of a Pharisee and a tax collector. They both went up to the temple to pray. First was the Pharisee who stood by himself and, and he began to pray, I thank you, God, that I'm not as bad as some of these other people, robbers and evildoers and adulterers, even this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I tithe a tenth of everything that I've got. And you remember this story, what happens when the tax collector, the tax collector didn't even come forward. He, as a matter of fact, he went further back. And instead of a posture of prayer of looking up to the heavens, he actually kept his head down. And he said in verse 13 of, of Luke chapter 18, he said, Oh God, as he beat his chest, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said, I tell you, it was this man, not the other, that went home justified before God. And he said, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And I love that story. Can you imagine standing up? I'm glad I'm not as bad as this person and this person and this person. But yet this tax collector humbly acknowledged his sin and received the forgiveness from God. And yesterday I did a funeral service, and again, it's always tough. I, I'm sorry I'd never met, met the person, and it's always tough when you didn't know the person, so you rely on the family to give you some personal illustrations and stories because I like to make it as personal as possible. And we've had a series of losses in this church and our extended family of faith like none I've ever seen before. I thought starting out last year, we had a lot of funerals. Well, it can't compare to how we're starting out thus far. And, but as I got to know about this person, I learned, number one, which I was grateful that they were a Christian, that they knew the Lord. It sure makes my job easier when I know they're saved and they're a Christian. But I also found out that this person wasn't perfect that they had some real struggles in their life. And when I stood up to do the funeral, I just felt led of the Lord to say in the middle of it, I said, you know what? Called the person by name. I said, he wasn't perfect. And I said, I'm not perfect. And I said, none of you are perfect. But that's why we look to our perfect God who loves us and forgives us of our imperfection. And today, don't allow pride or people or fear of being punished or how it's going to affect you. Don't allow that to keep you from acknowledging your mistake. But then secondly, that you would ask for forgiveness. To ask for forgiveness. Not only did David acknowledge his sin before God, but he said in verse 2, Wash me from all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Verse 7, cleanse me with hyssop so that I will be cleansed. Wash me so that I will be whiter than snow. He was asking for forgiveness. And when he said cleanse me with hyssop, that was a 
a ritual done for a cleansing or purification when an Israelite would be uh, around a dead body. It was the law that they would be cleansed with this plant, twigs that were used in the purification process, that they would be cleansed with hyssop so that they would be whiter than snow. And, and so David was saying, cleanse me, purify me. I was spiritually dead, but I'm asking that you would forgive me. And I want to tell you this. If you would read in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12, David was forgiven. But if you also read that, it said that the sword would never leave his family. And so, in other words... He was forgiven by God, but because of his bad decisions, it would forever affect his family. But we all know, too, that Jesus came from the line, from the line of David. So Jesus, our Messiah, came up through this legacy, this heritage. And so know that good can still come from the bad that sometimes comes into our lives. And and maybe you're here today and you need to ask for forgiveness. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. If we say that we do not have sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us or purify us from all unrighteousness. So we know God will forgive us. But we have to ask him for that forgiveness and maybe you're here today and you've been carrying around some guilt maybe you've been carrying around some bad decisions that you've made recently or from a long time ago and you need to ask God to forgive you because you know what the devil's going to keep you in slavery and bondage if you do not release that and ask God to forgive you I want to share with you that years ago, someone came to me, and as they began to talk, they lowered their head and even became emotional and, and said, Todd, when I was young and I wasn't married, I got pregnant, and I was scared and said, I had an abortion, and said, I've carried, I've carried this guilt around for my whole life, certainly my whole adult life. And uh, I just don't know what to do. And I said, well, first of all, I said, I just thank God that you are getting this off your chest and you're confessing your sin. And I said, I want you to know God loves you and he forgives you, and I do too. And I said, he will renew his love relationship with you and he will forgive you. Isn't it great that we serve a God who loves us unconditionally? And even though your sin may not be the same as hers, we've all done something. We've all made a mistake. We've all made a bad decision, and we've carried the guilt around. That's what the devil wants you to keep living in that guilt. But she left, I think, with a peace because I told her God would love her, forgive her, and he would restore her but she had to give it completely over to him. And that's the last point I want to make today, that we must accept his restoration. We must accept his restoration. David said in verse 10 of Psalm 51, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Verse 12, Restore to me the joy of my salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me in verse 13. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so they might turn away from their sins. And so I'm so grateful when he says, create in me a clean heart. That means a whole new heart from the very start. It's not the old heart. He's like, give me a whole new. This was a man after God's own heart. And if you read in Proverbs 4, 23, it says, Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. So you have to guard your heart. But he said, Create in me a clean heart, O God. I think about Paul saying in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, 
He is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And so today, to be restored, to accept his restoration, we have to ask him to give us a whole new heart. But then restore to me the joy of your salvation. He's saying, look, if you will accept my prayer and if your Holy Spirit does not flee from me or leave me, then I know that my troubled soul will be gladdened because you love me and you're unfailing through your unfailing love, you forgive me. But we have to accept it. You know, a lot of times we want to keep carrying this load around. I, I've shared this many times. I shared it the early. So we give it to God like a yo-yo. We give it to God and we take it back. We ask for forgiveness for this and then we take it back and try to carry it ourselves. We, we go around the world and we walk the dog. We do all these yo-yo tricks when God says, just give it to me once and for all and I'll take care of you. And we have to accept his restoration and that he's going to bring us new life and purpose and beginning. I'd be willing to say for those of you watching and some of you in this place, you've been suffering for many weeks, months, or even years from some bad decisions that you made. We all have made them. And uh, you don't have to carry that any longer. God loves you and me so much that he would send his one and only son to die on the cross. That whoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Give it to God once and for all. He loves you and he will forgive you. I want to close by sharing that recently someone wanted to meet with me and I met with them and this was the first thing out of their mouth. Will God, can God, love me? Can God love me? And as they began to have tears to stream down their face, I, I was just taken back and I said, what do you mean can God love you? And they began to share with me a painful story of some abuse that had taken place in their life when they were young. And even though they were the victim, they had carried a sense of guilt that they had done something wrong. And they were asking, can God, how can God love me? I think is exactly how it was said. I said, first of all, God created you in his image. You were formed uniquely in your mother's womb and you were made beautiful and know God loves you and he forgives you of anything that you think you've done or something that you feel like you've done. God loves you and he forgives you. Don't listen to the devil's lie. The devil likes to use us like a puppet and he wants us anytime we start feeling pretty good about ourselves and that we're trying to live a life that's holy and pleasing, the devil will Put those doubts and thoughts in our minds. Remember what you did. Remember what's happened to you. And then it just keeps us under that devil's lie. Don't give him that pleasure. Because God has already won the battle for you and me through Christ. And all you have to do is just accept his restoration. Say, I accept that you love me and that you forgive me. And I'm going to repent and turn away from those lies from the devil, and I'm going to walk in newness of life. And today you can do that, and all you have to do is just ask him to forgive you. And don't conceal your sin. You know what? Really, it's just being real before God. God already knows this anyway. I've told you, growing up in the church, in a Christian home my whole life, for years and years, we really didn't want anybody to know our, our mistakes, our dirty laundry. You know, we all tried to I mean, I don't think anybody wants to go broadcast it with a megaphone. But the fact is, we all have sinned and fallen short. And, but I think more than ever, we can be real today. We can be real and say, I'm not perfect. And then when it says to teach transgressors your way, then we can go to somebody else and say, look, this is what I've been through. 
and God forgave me and loved me and what he's done for me, he can do for you. And all you have to do is turn away from those thoughts and sinful uh, decisions you've made and start walking in newness of life. You can do that even now. Aren't you ready to make the greatest decision of your life? I close by sharing this. When I do premarital counseling, and you can agree to disagree, I tell them the three most important decisions we ever make. And again, we can agree to disagree. Number one is when you decide to ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart as your Lord and Savior, that is the most important decision you'll ever make in your life because it's the only one that lasts for eternity. Two, I said, is when you choose a, a spouse to, to spend the rest of your life with. Uh, that, to me, is, is a big decision. Three, I said, is a career path. You choose a job. Now, there are other big decisions about buying a home, buying a car, where you're going to college, making a big move, or taking a different job. But until you get number one in place, all these other things are insignificant. He's got to be number one. Until we get that factor where it needs to be, don't expect all these things to work out. It's when he's first place. Aren't you ready to make the greatest, the best decision of your life? You can do that even now as we pray together. God, I pray right now in the stillness of this moment for folks in this room or people that are watching, Lord, I pray that someone might pray and ask Jesus to come into their heart as Lord and Savior. They would acknowledge their sin. They would ask for forgiveness. And then they would accept, God, your mercy and grace and restoration. And they would begin to walk in newness of life, repenting from the old and becoming a whole new person that you would create a new heart, O oh God, a pure heart. Father, maybe there are Christians that have carried guilt for years. We've been saved, we've been forgiven, but we've never forgiven ourselves. Maybe we were young, maybe we were peer pressured, maybe we were abused, maybe we were mistreated, maybe something bad happened and we've taken the blame. Oh God, remove that guilt now that Satan would have no glory or victory. And we know, God, that you work all things out for our good and your glory according to your purposes, Lord, that you've called us. And Father, I just pray if there's someone been wanting to join a, a church family. We're not perfect. I say it every week just about, and I'm not perfect. There's not a person in this church that's perfect. But that's why we always tell people to keep their eyes on Jesus, because he is. Lord, I pray today that if we're listening to hear your voice, that you would call us to make the greatest decision we could ever make or some life-changing decisions that will affect not only today, but affect tomorrow and our eternal life. So give us that boldness Lord, to come to you in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite those of you worshiping with us in this place to stand as we're going to sing a hymn of decision, an invitation. And if you're at home and you would like to make a decision, contact us here at the church. We'll pray with you about your important decision. Won't you come as Jesus is calling?
thank you so much for worshiping with us both here and online. We pray that, that God spoke to your heart. Know that if you're on our email list, you'll be receiving discussion questions right after the service. I encourage you to reach out to people your family or with a friend to go over these discussion questions that will help. worship virtually. Maybe when this craziness is over, they'll start coming in person. And that's the same way with our 11 o'clock services. We, we've got a lot of people that are watching the service that aren't members of this church. I run into people in the community that say, I've been watching your services. Your jokes are outstanding. I, I'm kidding you. They haven't said that. That was a joke. But I have had people to say, we watch your service I'm grateful for that. So invite people to join us for worship so that they might come to be a part of this family of faith. But thank you for being here. Remember again how much God loves you and we love you too very much. Have a safe and wonderful afternoon as Bill leads us in a closing song. Thank you and God bless you.